Welcome everyone to this new Owen Helix Innovation Workshop on Data Inspired Medicines Design, uh, organized by uh, the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center. So I'm delighted today to have two great speakers who will run through their um, great insights on, on this topic and share with you. Um, as you probably heard at the very beginning of the workshop, this session is recorded, so obviously that will allow you to get back to it, but also share with colleagues who may have interest in the topic. And also we'd like to make it as interactive as possible, so if you have any questions or any specific topic that you would like to address, just drop a message in the chat box and uh, that will be addressed at some point. So without further ado, I am passing the virtual floor to Susan, who will start her presentation. Thank you, Susan. Thanks, Aileen. Hopefully you can hear me just fine. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with my colleague, Andy Maloney, to present Data-Inspired Medicines Design, which is a topic that's near and dear to both of our hearts. By way of a, a very brief introduction, um, uh, both Andy and I are members of the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center. I'll say a bit about CCDC in, in a few slides. Um, I came recently to CCDC as head of science after having spent nearly 30 years in the pharmaceutical industry working in drug development at Eli Lilly and Company. Andy, a couple words on your background. Uh, yes, yeah, so I've been at the CCDC a little bit longer in, in the material science team and have been for about six and a half years now. And before that, I was a, a chemical and computational crystallographer, so a bit of a nerd. Fantastic. So we thought we would start this workshop out with a question uh, in the truest spirit of a workshop. And, and that's to basically ask this audience what crystallographic data can be used to establish. And uh, I think um, we will end up coming back to this particular question and we'll see if any of the answers have changed, but feel free to you know, drop your ideas and your notions in the chat box that Andy's keeping an eye on. I think various aspects of crystallographic data may resonate with different individuals in different ways. Some of you may not know what crystallographic data is, but hopefully at the end of this presentation, we will both have an understanding of what crystallographic data is, how it's used to design and we think inspire uh, the medicines discovery and development, and maybe even have an answer uh, to this, this very question. And so I really wanna start by pointing out that behind every great medicine is a crystal. And these are some of the most important molecules to mankind. And what you are looking at are the chemical and crystallographic structures of each of these medicines that were determined by X-ray diffraction. And, and that's because many, many decades ago, it was determined that when you have a crystal and you shine X-rays on it, that is a very nice way to determine the molecular structure and the shape and the stereochemistry of your drug. So it's pretty clear that crystallography is very important in at least uh, identifying structures of medicines, but crystallography plays a much broader role in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, particularly if you consider that 90% of small molecule drug products are solid oral dosage forms, and the vast majority of those solid oral dosage forms are made up of, of crystals of your drug. And so in this presentation, I will be speaking to the earliest stages of how crystal structures, and, and here is the unit cell that describes what that crystal structure is, can help to understand molecules and, and how they hit their drug targets. Andy will pick things up to show how crystals can truly impact uh, drug development. And of course, my cartoon very much undersells the complexity of, of drug discovery and development. This is probably more of an indication of the many, many steps that are involved. And what we want to do is to take a closer look in this presentation at how data approaches can be used to augment the discovery and the development of our medicines in, in what is really an inspirational way. We have seen 
um, a lot that has been done in recent decades over computer aided drug design as well as development. And so the data inspired approach is actually the third wing of this. And we hopefully we will be able to share with you what it is about data that can really help augment uh, discovery and development. Before I say anything else, I do wanna say a bit about the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center. The CCDC is, an, is a nonprofit uh, charity uh, residing in Cambridge, UK. And this charity is dedicated to the advancement as, and the promotion of science, uh, crystallography and chemistry in particular. Uh, this organization is responsible for curating all of the publicly available small molecule crystallographic data in the world. And on top of the data that is provided, the CCDC has developed over many years a number of useful tools to mine the data, to interrogate the data, and to extract knowledge from it. Being a research institute and really uh, part of the, the, the central piece of, of the global structural science community, um, CCDC has a, a special role to play in forging research collaborations that promote and advance structural science and leverage their standing and their tools for outreach and educational purposes with the intention of growing the next generation of structural scientists. We draw our inspiration from one of our founders, Olga Kennard, who more than 50 years ago shared her belief, um, her passionate belief, if you will, that the collective use of data can lead to knowledge that would transcend well beyond the results of any individual uh, experiment. And, and that really is the foundation of a lot of the data-based or data-inspired approaches that we're going to be talking about. Hopefully we'll see in a few slides how the collection of data leads to really unique insights beyond what we see with any uh, one given molecule. So there are two important databases, two probably most important databases to discovering and developing drugs. The one, of course, is the Cambridge Structural Database. That's the world repository of, of published small organic molecule and metal organic uh, structures. And there also is the protein data bank, the PDB, which is also leveraged in, in drug discovery, if you will. And these two databases, as you can see, have grown exponentially in recent years. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, some of them being that, you know, the vast majority of historical data was obtained experimentally using x-rays. And, and these days, there are other methods such as electron diffraction, which are now just emerging, that really are expanding the substrates from which we can get structural data. We also now are seeing the emergence of computational me methods to compute crystal structures starting from a molecular structure. So from the structural science perspective, this is probably uh, the most exciting time ever in, in the history of structural science to, to be in, involved in, in this sort of work. Now, the molecules in the Cambridge Structure Database are uh, the result of research that has been going on for more than 50 years for all different purposes. But within that database, some of the most important molecules to mankind have crystal structures representing them. And you can see in, in this slide, uh, each of the uh, molecules among the 200 top selling drugs that for which there is a crystal structure entry in the Cambridge State Structure Database are, are shown in, in green and, and highlighted in gray are, are those that are that reside in, in, in the PDB. In white, of course, are the molecules that are not yet represented, but it is just a matter of time probably before some of these uh, very uh, biologically important molecules um, also become uh, represented in our databases. With any one molecule, um, a crystal structure can be really important to us. Uh, there's a lot of information that one can get about how molecules interact with themselves, or in the case of a protein ligand complex, how the, the ligand interacts with the protein. Any isolated crystal structure can give you unique insights into that molecule. But what's really special about the data-based approaches is that 
you can learn something about how that molecule crystallizes in the context of how the previous, in, at least in the case of the CSD, 1.1 million structures have crystallized. And this allows you to interrogate your crystal structure against the statistical distributions that you would see in the database. This allows you then to, for one thing, ask, is your structure correct? Is the molecular shape or the conformation representative, or is it somehow strained and unusual? Are the interactions which bind these molecules what I would expect them to be? Do I have the right number of hydrogen bonds? Are the pairings of hydrogen bonds that bind these molecules together, or aromatic interactions or other types of interactions what I would expect? How efficiently packed are the molecules in my crystal structure? Are there void spaces? And what might this mean for the physical properties of the molecules that we pursue? Each one of these sorts of questions can and, and inevitably will be asked for any given molecule that is in, in modern drug development. But what makes it possible to interrogate that, of course, is, is the bigger data. And so I wanna highlight two areas where big data can really help provide useful information, both for drug discovery and drug development. And the first instance is in understanding molecular shape. What we see on the right here are a series of compounds for which comparatively expensive QM calculations have been used to show what the energy penalty is for basically rotating a specific torsion angle. These are comparatively, as I said, expensive calculations, but what is really neat about the Cambridge Structure Database is that if you mine the structures that have these features, you can see distributions of structures that absolutely parallel what these more expensive calculations are telling you. And these informatics approaches can generate this information in a qualitative sense in, in seconds compared to hours and days. And you can imagine in a drug discovery setting, when you have many, many molecules in an SAR, it would be really nice to have a data-based approach to point us in the right direction. This is such a nice example because it really highlights that the most populated torsion angles are those which, as you would expect, are lowest in energy. And as the energy barrier between two conformations increases, you essentially see no representation among the structures in the CSD. So there's a lot of information embedded in the CSD about what the conformational preferences of a molecule might be. What shape does it take? In terms of intermolecular interactions, when you're optimizing a molecule by, uh, to make structural changes to more effectively interact, for example, with a, a protein receptor, you are going to want to know what the ramifications of structure modifications are in terms of how that molecule is to interact. So if, for example, you want to introduce a carboxylic amide into your molecule, you might be interested in how nearby amino groups on a protein residue, for example, might um, be suited for binding that molecule. And here what we do is look at a variety of small molecule crystal structures and we look at how the carboxylic acid or amide can interact with itself or other functional groups in the molecules in the crystal structure. And across the entire database, you see a distribution, if you will, of approaches. This can give tremendous amount of information into the geometry of intermolecular interactions. And so when we start pairing this information, when we start looking at the entire embodiment of the Cambridge Structure Database, now we start to get unique insights that any one single crystal structure, much as Olga Kennard had envisioned, um, will afford us. So for example, we can look at isolated torsion angles and the distribution of those torsion angles. And collectively across all of the flexible rotatable bonds, we can start to tease out what likely molecular conformations a molecule um, will adopt. Likewise, when we look at interactions to isolated uh, interacting, for example, hydrogen bonding sites, we can superpose those on the molecule of interest to understand what in this representation might be a hydrogen bonding environment. This hydrogen bonding environment is built up over many, many crystal structures in the small molecule database, but this is how these functional groups want to interact, whether it's in a small molecule crystal structure 
or in the protein receptor. And so where is this, does this information feed into drug discovery? Well, I think I'm trying to highlight in this, in this slide that information of, about molecular shapes and, and interaction patterns have a large role to play throughout the drug discovery process, starting with identifying protein ligand interactions to identify druggable targets, um, all the way through the process to where we identify and refine our small molecule structures to selectively interact with a target and hopefully avoid scaffold hops or other sorts of off-target interactions which could lead to side effects. Ultimately, what we want to do is to find the candidate structure, which we can select and push forward into the more expensive pathway um, or process that is drug development, which Andy will speak on shortly. But before I turn things over to Andy, I would like to talk about how these database approaches can fit in and then follow that with a couple small examples. What I have to say and what really needs to be said about drug discovery is um, that it is a very iterative process. Unlike developing an airplane or a bridge, drug discovery is very hypothesis driven. And that means that you come up with a hypothesis, you test, you analyze your results, and it's very circular. In the, in, in the aeronautics industry, you don't build an airplane to see if it will fly. If you're building a bridge, you don't build the bridge to see if it will bear the weight of what is going to be using it. Those sorts of innovations are done solely in a computer. That is just not the way drugs are developed. And so this becomes a very iterative and very expensive process to identify how to target certain drug molecules. And we maintain that with database approaches that we can drive or simplify or reduce the number of iterations that one has by limiting the design space very early on to identify compounds that are likely to interact with some fidelity with our target entities to limit the number of molecules that we would synthesize and ultimately test and, and even which compounds we would certainly progress into development sell to a commercial org organization or as a commercial organization purchase from a, drug, uh, from a discovery um, group. So we believe there's a huge upside to using these information rich uh, data driven approaches in, in the drug discovery scheme. So I mentioned just a couple um, final examples of, of what we mean in terms of how these knowledge based tools can be used for drug discovery. This is a nice example. Um, they both, both these examples will deal with L-dose reductase inhibitors, but this is a particularly nice, relatively recent example where authors from uh, Toho University and, and, the, and, and the COA company came together to look at, at these uh, green fluorescent protein probes, and they were able to use gold uh, docking tools from the CCDC to identify reasonable poses and it was pretty clear that certain hydrogen bonding functionality was required to drive binding. But there were also some signs, if you will, that other more subtle interactions were helping to drive the binding that they had experimentally observed. And sure enough, having taken these docking poses, they ran an analysis using the, the full interaction maps where you look at, at the likely interaction spots using our superstar methodology. And of course the carboxylic acid is exactly where we would have predicted it to be where it is interacting with the nearby uh, donors and, and acceptors. But what we were able, what they were able to confirm is that the quinoline ring, which they suspected might've been adding to the binding affinity because of hydrophobic interactions, was in fact exactly where hydrophobic interactions based on all of the crystallographic data that's been accumulated to date suggest that it would be. So this really was helpful in revealing features um, needed for this, this chromophore to exhibit the, the, hot, the high activity um, against the uh, L-dose uh, reductase. As a second example, I want to highlight applications of, of CrossMiner, which is a tool that we have that 
allows us to simultaneously search the Cambridge Structural Database and the Protein Database to look at common binding um, interactions between them. This was a nice example also for an L-dose reductase um, uh, application where the authors had synthesized these, these spiro compounds and they were looking to see what sorts of interactions with biologically relevant proteins might there have been. What's nice about this example was they were able to show for a small molecule where you might have protein binding and, and you can see that this would be incredibly helpful for looking at the biological effects of molecules that you're designing as well as metabolites or degradation products. In drug development, this sort of application could also play into looking at any sorts of small molecules that might come into contact with a drug product. So for example, if you had a packaging component and you were worried about small molecules that leached from the packaging components, you could be running these sorts of experiments to see what likely interactions those small molecule contaminants might have with receptors among the many, many proteins in the PDB. And so with that, I would like to hand the reins over to Andy, who is going to pick this up and talk to you about the applications uh, toward uh, data-inspired medicines development. Andy? Hi, uh, uh, thank you very much, Susan. I, I hope you can see my slides. Uh, yes. which should just be the one that you that you left off on so I'll exactly. um, quickly change my pointer to a laser and here we go so uh, well thanks very much for the for the first part of that that talk there there Susan like uh, like Susan mentioned I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the neck the neck what comes next when we're when we're building our airplanes or our, or our bridges and going from the the the, the discovery the dream from uh, our, our molecules to through the through this journey from uh, through materials to to real medicines that we can that we can that we can take to market that we actually have to we actually have to make these in a big factory somewhere uh, and how crystal structure can and the data that we have in the in the CSD can provide extra insights into into that journey I think the analogy between developing drugs and developing airplanes is a, is a really really nice one one of the reasons that we develop airplanes straight away to fly is because we have so much data uh, from from years and years of engineering and years and years of understanding of, of, uh, of what's going on there. And so what I want to talk to you about in the second half of this talk is really how important we can how we can get that structural data to to make a to make a difference and to really understand the, the systems that we're that we're looking at here. And there's various ways that we can think about this, and there's sort of three main stages of this journey that we can that we can think about in terms of in terms of data. We can think about it in early development, so just straight away from candidate selection, moving into phase one trials. We can we can start to use solid form as a as an enabler, um, to in this concept of fast to fail. So we can start to we can start to really think about how we might. How we might best make use of our, our crystal structure to think about think about stability, think about dissolution, think about how it's gonna it's gonna behave in, in the body. And so we can make some important mechanistic decisions uh, here. At the other end of the of the cycle, we can think about registration and, and regulatory submissions and thinking about how we upscale our, our manufacturing to larger facilities. And that, that involves a lot of its own its own challenges. There's challenges around reproducibility, there's challenges around making sure that what we do in the lab successfully scales up. Uh, to, to our production and we need to make sure that we're doing everything in low cost and zero defect batch failures aren't good at that point in time we want to make sure that we know what we're doing and we can reproduce it every time so that everything is as cost effective as as it possibly can be and to get there to bridge that to bridge that gap to make that journey we need to we need to really think about this this key mid stage of, of development here when we start to think about formulation we start to think about moving into phase phase two and three trials that's when we have to make some difficult decisions and that's when we have to make move from these early fast to fast to fail strategies to something that's much more commercially commercially sustainable um, there's a number of risks we need to identify in doing so, and we need to be able to confidently assess uh, and understand these risks and, and manage them, understand the implications that they'll have and, and 
what what we need to do in order to in order to minimize them and so i'm going to talk through each of these each of these points in in turn so we'll start off with the the early early development in the in the solid form space it's really about making those decisions that that enable um preclinical or, or, or clinical studies and we want to minimize the the time and enabled us to make the best decisions that we that we can at, at these points so what we want to do is we want to do things quickly we want to maintain as much flexibility as we can in our approaches and probably spend as little time as we as we need to making sure that what we've got is is fit for purposes is what we want to what we want to take forward we're thinking about chemical and physical stability at this point um often we'll go for for a crystalline form because these tend to increase stability we know what we're dealing with but of course with more crystalline forms forms with the crystalline with crystalline structures uh, we can have issues with solubility and we need to maintain the right levels of solubility to allow the, the flexibility of doses that we need in, in our early our early clinic, clinical trials and so we want maybe want to think about the, the structures that we have the materials that we have and how we might enhance their solubility through co-crystallization or through or through possibly possibly dispersion of in, in amorphous in amorphous means and to provide you with a, a, a real example is how we can use we can use structural data and the same sorts of structural data that Susan mentioned uh, in when we're designing these these molecules to think about designing solid forms. So this is a uh, leflunamide. Uh, that's a it's a it's a rheumatoid arthritis uh, drug, um, which is doesn't exhibit fantastic solubility. And so uh, this this group here and uh, this in this publication um, used some some tools and some analysis from the from the CSD to think about how they might they might improve the solubility of uh, leflunamide through through co crystallization. So initially, they they used the isostar methodology that, that, that Susan mentioned previously in the, the examples with 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 superstar. Um, and so by breaking the molecule down into fragments, we can look at the individual interactions and the dispositions of those of those interactions across the CSD to, to understand what what other what other types of functional groups are going to prefer to interact with with our molecule. And we can then I identify some some candidate co-crystallizers uh, to to do our to do our experiments to try to find some some systems that that will that will give us positive positive outcomes. So by refining our, our list of co-formers based on this required functionality, because of our understanding from the data, we're able to do less experiments. We can further refine that by thinking about molecular complementarity approaches. These are developed on an understanding of co-crystals in the in the CSD and what likes to co-crystallize with what. And from doing that, we can identify identify a set of experiments that we know are going to try are going to give us the highest likelihood of the outcomes that we that we want to achieve so we're prioritizing our activities and we end up making some new solid forms with some better dissolution properties so in this graph on the on the side here you can see leflunamide itself the dissolution profile for this here and how that's improved by different co-crystal modifications so this is we're, we're achieving what we want to hear by being clever and thinking about the data that we that we have at, at hand to to help us do that design part that rationalization of, of where we want to be. If we think at the other end of the spectrum, um, when we start to think about new drug applications and commercial manufacturing, there's, there's a lot of different challenges to those earlier fast to fail strategies that we're able to think about when we're, when we're still thinking about candidate selection in, in early trials. From a regulatory sense, we need, to, we need to demonstrate that we really understand a material and understand what's going on in, in terms of the solid form from the initial crystallization through a number of, a number of unit operations, such as isolation, drying, um, to make sure that we're confident about everything to do with the medicine down to the shelf life, down to how long it's going to last and how long we're going to be able to, it's going to be effective for, for patients. So this is all about risk assessment, understanding a material, mitigating any potential problems that, that, we, that we might have a, along the way. And so really getting a, getting a handle on, on, what, on what's going to be going on there. We also need to think about about tech transfer and, and further transfer through the through the life cycle and the of the drug as well. We need to be as confident as we can about the stability and the stability that we've seen in the lab. That when we transfer that up to batch manufacturing at a, at a large site, or when we start to think about offshoring that to somewhere else with with very different um, humidity or uh, or environmental conditions, that we are confident we're going to keep seeing the same thing that we that we've seen before. We need to we need to understand that, and it's really it's not worth thinking about when that goes wrong. I'm sure I don't need to, to tell you about these two 
these two examples, these two really high profile examples that really, really changed thinking in, uh, in pharmaceutical development and manufacturing. Uh, we've got the cases of, of ritonavir and, and ritigotine, and uh, where new polymorphs, new morphs, new polymorphs with different properties really had an incredibly detrimental effect. And in all the times, it's, it's often changes in solubility that new, these new polymorphs come, uh, lead to. Um, the second polymorph of, of uh, ritonavir meant that it had to be removed off, removed from market and, re and reformulated. And it was, a, it was a huge and huge amount of, uh, of effort and reputational damage went into, went into these things. Not to mention the effects on the, the lives of the patients that are, that are taking these medicines. It's, it's so important that we get these things right first time. So we don't need to redevelop them to rethink the to rethink our, our approaches and that we we don't have to remove remove things from these vital therapies from from market so how do we really get that sort of thing right and it's in this it's in this middle bit it's in understanding where we are in terms of our solid form when we start to think about formulation when we start to think about moving on to phase two and three trials that we can really start to make these difficult decisions to make these this to establish this understanding of our solid form uh, to understand how we do the right kind of screening to make sure we have that confidence in our solid form that we can confidently make uh, make applications to, to regulatory bodies to, to take a new take a new product to market and so what we need to do is we need to move from those fast to fail studies to these commercially viable viable strategies and and think about how we go from our understanding of our solid form to thinking about formulation and how we can start to bring in risk assessment and our understanding of, of risk and, and mitigation um, into, into, into our, our understanding of this journey um, at, at this point here. Now I'd like to highlight a really nice, nice white paper that we that we published quite recently and um, that, that thinks about the that thinks about this journey that thinks about this process and thinks about this concept of a, of a mat wall or a material wall about how all how all the bricks fit into place and you can and various different different assessments of risk along the along the development pipeline can can give you something that you're you're confident in uh, at the at the end of the at the end of the day. Now, how this works, uh, thinking about uh, thinking about stability, uh, we're going to stick with balls for a second. We're going to going to use the analogy of, of stability in in these two these two walls here. Now, if I have I've got two walls here, A and B, two different motifs of, of putting my bricks together uh, to make walls. And I, I want to know that I'm making the best wall for, for me. Um, so what I can do is I can think about my, my database of, of walls around the world. Uh, and I can look at what people have done before uh, and other walls that haven't fallen down to make a more informed decision about, about how I'm going to build my, build my new wall. So I can look at the Great Pyramid of Giza uh, and I can see motif A. I can look at Hadrian's Wall, and I can see Motif A. I can look at the Great Wall of China, I can see Motif A. I can look at my own house and see Motif A. I can look at the CCDC and see, and see Motif A. And the, what brings all these buildings together, uh, illustrious as they, they may all be, uh, is that they all, none of them have fallen down yet. So there's something in here, I'm particularly glad about my house in that regard, and of course the CCDC too. Um, but there's some, so there's something inherently, inherently stable about this arrangement of, of bricks in, in motif A that, that lends stability to these, these structures. And, that, and that's where we get this, this idea of, of, of a database. The frequency of our observations of, of motif A gives it that, is it shows it's the one that achieves stability. And of course, this is an, an analogy to the, to the Cambridge Structural Database itself. And this is the idea of structural informatics and how we can use that information, how we can use the information on intermolecular interactions, on intramolecular geometries, to make information, to make informed decisions and informed assessments about, about risk and about stability. If we keep seeing the same thing over and over again in the database, there's a reason for that. And so that gives us this, this concept of solid form informatics, of, of data inspired, inspired risk assessment. And you've seen some of these from what, from what Susan talked about earlier. We've got, we've got Isostar and Superstar in our database of, of intermolecular interactions. And we've got, we've got Mogul in our database of bond lengths, angles, and torsions. These are really important for understanding our geometric preferences for our molecule, for understanding our conformational flexibility and any risk of conformational polymorphism we might see. And to, to think about how 
how happy and how, how satisfied our, our interactions are. But we can think a little bit deeper in terms of the intermolecular interactions through, through really getting to grips with, with the data and the database. And we can start to do some really quite clever things. And we can use some tools that have been developed over the years by the CCDC to, to identify probabilities and stabilities of different intermolecular interactions. I'm going to talk about a couple of these quite briefly now. So hydrogen bond propensities are a way of identifying probabilistically uh, likely hydrogen bond networks and the expected number of interactions per, per donor and acceptor molecule. And you can see what the output of that looks like on the, on the right hand side there. So this is for, uh, for the drug excitinib. Um, which forms a number of a number of different forms, um, both um, um, multi-component and, and and otherwise. It's a very it's a very complicated molecule. It's got a very complicated solid form landscape. This molecule, but by carefully thinking about similar structures in the CSD, about the intermolecular interactions that we form, we can start to think about other environment, other explanatory variables like like the aromaticity of a molecule and uh, how. Um, how sterically hindered our different functional groups are to construct what's what's effectively a machine learning model. So it's a it's a it's a it's a regression model, um, but what that gives us is a, a probability at the other end of of how likely we are to find different hydrogen bonding networks. And so you can see down the down the bottom right where I have a high probability of high, good hydrogen bonds forming, and I've got a high a high probability of satisfying the coordination preferences of my my functional groups. This is where I find my stable form. And the red point here is where I've got a metastable form. So I know that for my new drug, if I end up in the middle here, I need to look harder. I need to find that more stable, more thermodynamically stable form that I can have more confidence in to, to take forward. And full interaction maps, another way that we can think about the, the geometries of those interactions themselves. So once we know about the probability of the of their occurrence, we can start to think about in my particular crystal structure, are they forming in the, the best way that they that they can? And so there's an example here from this is a, a paper from 2015 looking at a, an early development candidate from from Pfizer um, that has that has two different polymorphs. Form A is metastable and form form B is stable. And what you can see here is the the full interaction maps as we call them. So these are combined representations of those, those isostar plots that, that Susan mentioned uh, earlier, where rather than focus on a single functional group and the interactions around that, we can think of these, these, as, these interaction maps holistically over, over our, our whole molecule. And so the red blobs that you can see is where we expect to find a hydrogen bond acceptor, and the blue blobs are where we expect to find our, our hydrogen bond donors. So this is data derived from the, from the entirety of the, C, of the CSD. And by thinking about our molecule and its interaction preferences in situ in the crystal structure, we can start to make inferences about stability here. So you can see the different hydrogen bonds that we're forming in our metastable form and our, our stable form. In our stable form, our functional groups are right in the middle of these blobs. They're exactly where we expect them to be from a geometric preference, these, these are perfect. We're in a good place here. Contrast that to what's going on in the metastable form, where our, our functional groups are wherever they want to be. They're not in the right place, OK? Um, that, that's a risk right there when we're not, we're not matching up. We're not seeing what the data is telling us that we expect to be seeing. We know there's something more stable that we can find. And we need to find that. And we need to have the confidence in how, that, in how that's going to behave. Because that crystal structure is huge. The crystal structure that we, that we nominate to, to go forward has huge implications downstream. And this is something that we're, we're starting to look at at CCDC and that I'm, I'm particularly excited about because our crystal structures give us information about, about our morphologies, about the, part, the shapes of the particles we make, the surfaces that we expose and the chemistry that's present at, at, those, at those crystal surfaces. Not to mention how the, how the molecules pack and how that will affect our, our mechanical properties downstream. So we can really start to draw, draw links between, between crystal structure, particle shape, and downstream properties like, like flowability, like, like punch sticking. We can, we can start to work out the means of, of, of and the important factors that, that go into that, uh, into the impact of our, our crystal structure on on our downstream processes. And I think for me, that's that's hugely exciting. That's that's us getting to the place that we can. We know our airplanes are going to fly before before we take the first bit of metal off the shelf. It's we're getting to the same the same sort of place in in drug development. And I think that's I think that's great. So. 
to wrap up briefly about where we're, where we are with our um, our risk assessment of that comes from comes from data it's all about it's all about understanding our our solid forms how much, how well do i under, understand my solid form what are the right experiments to do to improve my understanding of that solid form and our informatics analyses can help answer that question as to when we might need more screening and when we when the data looks sound we can we can carry on um, it's all about raising the finding out those red flags as, as early as we possibly can and doing something to, to mitigate them to better understand them and like I said whether that's by experimental screening or whether that's a more expensive computational method these these rapid assessments that we can do from from database approaches make us give us that, that extra confidence to, to take those on when we when we need to and so it's that that quick computational thing that you can you can do on that you can pop out the lab do the calculation on your desktop quickly go back in and say okay it's fine let's take this forward we're happy with this that's 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 what we can that's what we can achieve from from this so I hope that in the over the last uh, last forty minutes or so, we've 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 shown the the knowledge that we can derive from from structural databases. This, that statistical information can can both in, inspire design of of new new medicines, but also give reassurance and and that that sort of that backing to the decisions that we have to make during during pharmaceutical development. Um, we've shown the the data in the CSD in terms of confirmations can can give information about how drugs interact um, in binding sites and proteins and as well as how we can we can link that to stability and how the data can give us insight into into designing designing new molecules as well. Um, so thank you very much for for your attention and to hopefully what we've done is we've given the answer to the question. Um, from earlier on in the talk that of course Chris, it's it's, a, it's always all of the above in these in these multiple choice things but really the the power of the power of crystallographic data that we can that we can bring to bear at, at all all steps of that that journey from molecule to medicine um it, re, it, re, it really does ring true thank you andy answers and um a really really good overview of yeah how you can use data because I hear all the time how data is important in drug discovery and drug development that uh, you just get up through the exact how you can leverage that in databases for um, biochemistry application so yeah thanks that, I think that was really good um, so I think it's time for some audience question and I can just see one popping now so how does database size affect this technique so that's that, that's an interesting question. Um, so as you've seen from the from the chart that that, that Susan showed earlier earlier on, the the CSD is the CSD is quite big and it's getting it's getting bigger. So it's over one point one million million structures now. When we when we started thinking about solid form informatics, um, we had probably about, about half that number really. And so it's it's interesting to see how the how the tools and the the methods have, have developed over time. All data is good data. In, in these terms, I think the more data points you have available, the more the more you start to you start to understand your systems, and it's is that it's having that I suppose it's that extra bit of creativity that comes into the the design parts by having by having more data points to draw from as more and more exotic chemistries become more normal, um, the design approaches become become more robust, but our risk assessment approaches become become more useful as well. You know, as we as we get more data, we can we can really start to start to make them a little bit more bespoke, a little bit more refined, and focus on the the crystal the crystal structures, the chemistries that that are much more closely linked to to novel novel molecules than we than we might have been able to before. I think there's there's certainly value in in increasing increasing the size of the CSD and and being able to link that to to proprietary data sources as well I think that's that's certainly something that we're that we're keen to that we're keen to think about too that the portfolios of pharmaceutical organizations I'm sure sure Susan can it's going to attest to this can often be a bit different from what we see in the CSD but by combining that data and thinking about it holistically, we can really start to start to paint that picture of of understanding that and answering those questions. So there's another question in, in the chat. Does the CSD capture the pharma space or the pharma chemical space? 
I think it's important to recognize that the, all of the applications we've discussed here today are, are largely based on interrogation of our, the publicly available Cambridge Structure Database, but the tools that we've developed to interrogate structures can and are being used within the pharmaceutical industry against proprietary data sets. And publications have shown, my own internal previous experience has shown, that when you apply these tools um, for your proprietary data alongside the Cambridge Structure Database, that your models definitely improve. And that just tells you that, yes, the, the Cambridge Structure Database is getting extremely large, but it by no means captures all of chemical space. And so as it continues to grow, the ability to, to model and, and predict what sorts of structures and properties are, are available um, is only going to get better and better. And then in a related answer to the CSD capturing pharma space, uh, the CCDC has done a, a really nice job in, in capturing subsets of the CSD that are very specific to certain types of applications. And one of those subsets is the drug subset. And that's been very useful to groups around the world who are really interested in drug ability and pharmaceutical uh, properties um, of drug molecules. And so it is really nice when, when we see applications for very uh, targeted um, opportunities for targeted applications, you know, we can, we can pull subsets of the most relevant molecules from the entire CSD to basically enrich and, 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 and tailor that sort of application to make sure that the data is most representative. Yeah, I think I think that's a that's a really nice example to to think about in terms of in terms of subsets and the drug subsets one that's particularly close to my heart because it's, it's I'm on that publication. Please please cite it. Um, in the, in that in that study when we when we developed the drug subset, it was it was part of a larger collaborative project, and as a as a result of that, we were we were able to look at at the in-house uh, crystal structure databases of of two of two pharmaceutical companies that we that we were collaborating with, and we were able to look at the, the similarities and the differences between the, the CSD, the drug subset of the CSD and, and in-house pharmaceutical databases as well. And that, that really helps us understand the like the, those those similarities, those differences, how we need to be, uh, how we need to really understand uh, different different areas of, of chemical space. But definitely, as the as the CSD get gets bigger, it expands into into those those areas really really nicely. And the, every if, every year that goes by, we get we get more 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 drug structures. You can you can mm -hmm. see that from the from the the nice graphics earlier on. So we have another question about whether electron diffraction, which is a growing field, how represented in the CSD um, ED structures are. Um, I will say that that is absolutely an emerging field. The nice thing about the electron diffraction, and I, I touched upon this in, in my portion of the seminar, is that the, the requirements for the, I, I say large, comparatively large crystals that you need for single crystal X-ray diffraction, those requirements are, are not there for electron diffraction. You can get structural information um, basically at the nanoscale, which really opens up the opportunities to start getting at structural information for things that are difficult or challenging to crystallize. And so we are seeing more and more structures um, derived from X-ray diffraction, or I'm sorry, electron diffraction uh, being submitted to the CSD. And Andy, I don't know if you have the exact numbers. I'm, aware, I'm I believe it's a couple hundred structures. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, though. Uh, so far, that's so that's that's the right order of magnitude, certainly um, for the for the number of structures we have. But it is becoming a more and more popular technique, and I think sort of quite quite recent uh, recent studies have shown its it, the applicability to to small to small molecules, particularly pharmaceuticals. It's it's a real area of interest there. So I don't I don't doubt we're gonna we're gonna see more of these um, uh, over the, over the over the next few years. Um, how we how we how we think about those structures, how we how we continue to to adapt them and, and think about them and their and their place in the in the database will will continue to continue to develop as well. But it's it's certainly an an interesting area for us for moving forward. Okay. 
Okay, I can't see all the, the, the question in the chat. I, I have a quick one for you, a bit less scientific. Uh, there is one, I'll keep mine for later. <laughs> so <laughs> to what extent can databases be mined to generate de novo structures? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think, I, I think they can. I think it's 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 the, it's that idea about design, and it's that it's that thinking about. I suppose the the, the cross miner example feeds into this uh, a, a little bit. How we can we can think about okay, if I if I have a structure and I if I if, if I, I know I know roughly what I want to do, and I can I can maybe see a similar molecule in the in the CSD. If I can sort of think, well, okay, maybe I want another another leaving group here, another hydrogen bond acceptor there. What's been what's been done before? How can I how can I use that that knowledge of what's come before to to develop something to develop something new? I think there's there's certainly lots of lots of applications of of design and and, and data mining and thinking about thinking about the the sort of transformations we can make in terms of in terms of in terms of scaffold hops in terms of scaffold hopping to to generate these new medicines and in terms of in terms of match molecular pairs as well i think that's that's a really interesting interesting avenue that we've we've explored in the past to think about those those different the, the sort of related structures that we can make we can make little tweaks to to develop something quite different with quite different properties, understanding those those transformations is is certainly uh, achievable with the uh, the data that we have in the in the database. Andy, I would I would also add to your to your answer. Um, the, certainly, drug companies are all looking at making new molecules that have never been made before. Mm. And so databases, whether it's the CSD, or PDB, or or any databases, are constantly mined, not just for the examples we've shown to say, hey, will this molecule potentially interact with the target I'm interested in? But they're also mined to make sure that you are operating in a space where you have freedom to operate from an intellectual property perspective. So you need to make sure that there aren't certain scaffolds or certain targets that are essentially off limit because they're patent protected. So there are a whole host of reasons why you might leverage uh, different kinds of data for different purposes in discovering and uh, designing new molecules um, of interest. So I didn't know if we wanted to get into intellectual property issues, but it always seems to come up <laughs> one way or another. Um, what's missing in the CSD? Um, and do we notice any gaps? Um, if there, are, if there, there are some, and I think there's always going to be gaps in, in, a, in any experimental database that, 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 we, that we can, that, that, we, that we put together, because um, there, there's, I suppose, there's, there's a limit to to what experimentalists are willing to experiment on, to an extent. I think um, the coverage in the CSD is it's consistent in some places, it's it's less consistent in others, and it's I think there's a there's a there's a community effort to to try to improve that certainly as we as we start to think a little bit more about about big data approaches, about machine learning, about completeness of of data. Um, I think there's certain conversations that that we need to that, that we that we are having um, around how we how we can how we can deal with that sort of thing. And so, just because it's not in the CSD, of course, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Is that is my is a is a mole, is a molecule not polymorphic because it's not polymorphic? Is because nobody's prodded it enough times to to find out to find out if it is. Um, so one of the so one of the things that we what we don't know is what we what we don't know in in the in these regards. But um, I think with the I think with the, the the approach from the community nowadays is that all data is good data, whereas previously a potentially negative result might have been sort of just put in the put in the cupboard and, and ignored. We can we see these things coming into the into the database a lot more that we get submissions of structures that that aren't going to be part of a, a bigger publication, but that are still useful to the to the whole of the database. And so that that fits in as well. Andy, I would add, of course, the very first thing I thought was what you had already mentioned was polymorphs. You know, so much of what folks study, you know, um, so many of the studies stopped at crystallizing a composition the first time. 
not looking at how else in the form of polymorphs might that same composition crystallize. But there are other gaps as well. For example, um, how structures respond to different impetuses such as temperature and pressure. And so those are more difficult experiments they can be to do. So there's a lot more uh, by way of data that really needs to be um, added to the CSD in terms of structures at different temperatures and pressures. And I would also add that when you consider um, drug development pipelines, the molecules that drug companies used to develop even five or 10 years ago are a lot smaller and a lot, a lot less flexible than what the molecules in modern drug development pipelines are. So there is a, a whole gap, which is not exactly the easiest to fill for larger modal other modality sorts of structures, smaller peptides, nucleotides, you know, RNAs and these sorts of things. And, and I, I say that as a gap that's difficult to fill because those molecules can be very difficult to crystallize, let alone crystallize in a suitable substrate to get the structures. But how nice will it be when we start mastering the techniques to routinely crystallize these considerably larger molecules that happen to be in our drug development pipelines? Mm. Yeah, it's it's. I think I think that, that that that's right. It's the the increasing complexity, and in, certainly in pharmaceuticals, but I think in in all sorts of of materials uh, design that um, the the they are difficult to crystallize. It's it's difficult to to get an understanding of of these structures. But I think yeah, techniques develop. People find ways to to do it and to and to succeed in it. So I think I think I think we'll I think we'll start to see them. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I'm I'm hopeful anyway. Yeah. Definitely excellent ideas in the chat box about adding experimental data that's other than crystal structure data. In other words, property data, for example, for all of the crystal structure ent en uh, entries. And, and that is a, a clear opportunity, viewed as a gap, which it is, but it's an opportunity to really enrich the structural database. So that is, that is definitely um, the case and, and a very interesting question about non-crystallizing structures, which you know, it, you can put the smiley face because we all laugh, but the reality is, is that, you know, in my experience in the pharmaceutical industry, the people who were interested in keeping a molecule from crystallizing sought out the crystallization experts because there's no one who understood crystallization better than the, the, the crystallization people when you want to prevent it. So there's an awful lot to be said about crystal structures and about what leads to good efficient packing um, which is conducive to stable crystal structures. So the information is there. I don't know that we've harnessed what it's going to take to tap into that information yet. That's an active area, but it is exciting. And there's, there is a huge need for rendering drug molecules amorphous based on the, the considerably improved solubility properties of our very insoluble drug molecules. Thank you, Susan, for having covered both the chat about what's going on and also the last question. So I think you did a really good job in that. Uh, so I think we have a minute to wrap up. So maybe I'll do it. My question was just about, and actually I can nearly give the answer, but it's just to take the perspective of the ones who are part of the One Nucleus Network. So let's say the smaller companies who may, you know, are starting a, a drug discovery program, they work on these targets. And so I was just to ask you this question, when is the right time to come to you? Um, and, and for what? So accessing database, yes, but also to have, you know, access to your services. Uh, and I think you made a really good point also about, it, it's not just about accessing the data and making enlightened decision and, and the risk yes of course we want that but it's also these questions around freedom to operate that is that is very important so if i say the sooner is the best is it the right answer i think the sooner the better is definitely the right answer until you start using the data and thinking about how the data can work for you it's it's less easy to understand how it can be essentially your best friend and so hopefully part of uh, parts of of this presentation can kind of stimulate the ideas to, to to generate the interest in reaching out to us because 
until you until you start looking, you don't realize just how helpful these data inspired approaches can be, and the tools that are now there, and beyond that, the expertise and the experience warehoused in the CCDC. The CCDC has a load of uh, loads of experts who are willing to talk and help to resolve the problems. And, and certainly we provide structural data, we, we offer our software, but we also have an emerging services um, group that really focuses on honing in on the problems and partnering with companies toward the solutions to their problems. Thank you very much, really good wrap up. And thank you very much both, Andy, Suzanne. That was really, really insightful workshop. Hope you enjoyed. Um, and as I said, feel free to share this workshop widely because I think it's very valuable. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, all.